Welcome to this channel's inaugural Q&A session. Uh, today I'm going to be answering questions that were provided by my supporters over on Patreon. This one is a special edition that will be available to everyone here on YouTube. But going forward, uh, I will be doing these sessions monthly as a Patreon exclusive. So without further ado, let's get into it. Question number one, what's the worst game you've ever played? <laughs> All right, well, we're getting right into it to uh, start here. This is, a, this is a tough question for me to answer because if I'm being completely honest and objective about it, uh, the worst game I've ever played is almost certainly one of the many prototypes I've slapped together during my game dev career. But uh, excluding that, uh, I really don't like to think too hard about bad games. You may notice that I haven't really done a video on this channel uh, that really rips into a game, um, any kind of negative reviews or something like that. And that's very deliberate on my part. My general policy about games that I really don't like is I don't play them. Life's too f short, folks. And from where I sit, there's still a huge number of great games that I need to go and play. Why would I waste my time playing something that I don't enjoy? And yeah, I've taken some joking pot shots at Final Fantasy 16 over the past few months, but the worst game I've ever played is not Final Fantasy 16. That game is just mediocre, truth be told. The other problem, thinking on it, is that I just don't really remember the truly awful games that I come across. I've certainly played stuff that was buggy, broken, underdeveloped, amateurish, but again, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about them. So, uh, I don't know if I can tell you what the objectively worst game I've ever played is, but I don't think that's what this question is driving at here. If I may, and this is my channel, so I may, if I may uh, rephrase the question to what I think you're really wondering about here, uh, which is what is my least favorite game? And that I think is a bit more interesting to get into. Now, the moment that I mentioned that I'm a Metroid fan, all the other Metroid fans can probably see where I'm going here. Yeah, my least favorite game is Other M. How did you guess? But if I think about Other M and why it's my least favorite game, uh, I think there's some, some revealing stuff here. Because make no mistake, Other M is a bad game. Its story is bad, its gameplay is bad, um, its aesthetics are, in my opinion, just kind of outright ugly. And it's a narrative sequel to one of my all-time favorite games, the best Metroidvania ever made, Super Metroid. Those aren't the reasons why I find Other M so repulsive, though. I've played bad sequels before, and like I've mentioned, those sorts of bad games just come and go from my mind. They're, they're not worth thinking about too hard. But I think the problem with Other M uh, was that it had a lot of potential. Um, there was a lot to grab onto there. And I also think it's just like a perfect example of how, you know, the old saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So other folks here on YouTube have beat this dead horse, you know, over a decade ago. So it's not even really a dead horse anymore. It's just kind of a fossil at this point. But I really want to just ex excavate this fossil and get a few of my own wax in here. Because I think with a few little changes, well, maybe not little changes, but with a few changes, Other M could have been a good, and if not a good game, at least an interesting addition to the Metroid franchise. The narrative sticks out the most because ostensibly that's what Other M was trying to do, was trying to tell a story. So if you're not familiar with Metroid Fusion, they introduce a character there, Adam, and Samus talks about kind of her past with this guy, speaks about him in really glowing terms. So they kind of hint at that in Metroid Fusion, and so Other M was supposed to kind of pay off this little setup that they did in, in Fusion, and Other M was supposed to be like kind of about this backstory. It was about uh, who the heck Adam Malkovich was and what, why exactly Samus, uh, you know, thought so highly of him. So going off of that, the, the place you'd probably, in, in terms of the narrative timeline that you would set Other M, where, do, where does it make most sense? It makes most sense to, to make it a prequel then, right? You know, 
actually the part of play, you know get to play the part of the story uh where samus meets adam and her time in the federation forces etc but other m doesn't do that um instead it takes place immediately after super metroid and samus like the the whole um inciting incident is there's a distress call and samus goes to this station or ship and adam and his you know squad of federation troopers are there too and thinking on this i think this was the biggest mistake that other m made it was really weird to introduce someone who our main character has like had this falling out with previously and there's this kind of strained estranged relationship while you know this this sort of much more stock sci-fi action plot is going on now i'm not saying you can never like start here as a writer you, you there's obviously ways to do this but this is like turning up all the difficulty sliders on this, right? Because now you have to do a bunch of exposition to establish their previous their previous relationship, um, which Other M does in the most clunky manner possible. There's also the authorization system where Samus has she she still has all of the upgrades from Super Metroid to her power suit, uh, but in order to make the gameplay work, um, she essentially has to like turn off parts of her suit until Adam gives her the okay to use them. And like, what? That's kind of another thing about this. Samus had this falling out with Adam previously. They established this, but she just kind of submits to his orders here, despite him not having any formal authority over her. As I said. Plenty of people have gone into this, so I'm not going to relit relitigate it here. But the interpersonal and gender dynamics here are super wonky, to say the least. And honestly, it's just bad writing overall. The other scene that caused its fair share of discourse back in the day was uh, Ridley comes back in Other M because, well, we can't think up of a new villains or anything, and even back then... Uh, we were stuck in this kind of remake and nostalgia hell where everything has to be a reference to something already established in the series or whatnot. But what really confused the heck out of a lot of people, and I think for very good reason, was that Samus, um, seeing Ridley here, has something resembling a, a PTSD sort of trigger, like, episode, and she has to get saved by the other characters and like that's really weird because at this point in the story she's already fought and killed Ridley twice in just the main series games and I think two more times if you count the prime games and other M doesn't really establish why Samus would have PTSD for seeing Ridley it, it makes an implication something that was shown in some like zero mission artwork um that was that ridley was responsible for the raid on the colony where samus you know as a child was living and that he was responsible for killing her human parents but like other m just like it cuts to Samus and it shows her as this like panicking child briefly and doesn't say anything else. It just kind of assumes you know that part of the story already. So yeah, it's just really clunky, but I do want to make it clear that I'm not necessarily opposed to the idea of like Samus having PTSD or, you know, her being something other than, you know, a steely stoic bounty hunter, destroyer of worlds or whatnot. Like I actually think it's rather interesting. Uh, it's an, it's a really interesting, interesting approach to depict this one woman army as someone who's working through you know trauma anxiety and maybe even a lack of confidence like that could be a really compelling story but like wouldn't that be a much easier lift if this game took place before metroid one like you can keep the scene with ridley and everything and it makes much more sense now because this is same as seeing him again for the first time since like the childhood traumatic incident. Uh, maybe then you could have like Adam be the guy that comes in and, and swoops in and helps her in the situation and, and drives Ridley away or whatever. And that's the moment where like their, their relationship is kind of forged. Um, you know, she comes to respect him as this sort of father figure. And that makes a lot of sense. So part of me really wonders if that's what they were originally planning to do with Other M. But 
for some reason, I, I'm guessing, just speculation here on my part, that like some suits at Nintendo um, insisted that the game had to be like a direct sequel to Super Metroid because Super Metroid is the very like uh, critically acclaimed prestigious entry in the series. And the script and everything else they had planned for Other M never really got adjusted for that change. Um, it's a perplexing decision, um, but the thing is, is that there's there's some other just weird decisions, just bizarre choices that kind of make this game a real train wreck. So Other M was a collaboration between Nintendo and Team Ninja. Um, those were the folks who did sort of at the time the, the, the revival of the Ninja Gaiden series. So they decided to make Other M kind of this 3D brawler and I was like, cool, I, I can get on board with that. There's definitely a lot of potential there. That could be great. But I think, yet again, the problem that came in here was uh, Nintendo corporate was kind of meddling with things. Again, this is speculation on, on my part. I don't actually know. Uh, I can't confirm this or not. But they made the, the decision for this game to only use a Wiimote. No nunchuck, just the Wiimote. Now... I don't know about you, but we had a really good reason to put analog sticks onto controllers once we started to do a lot more 3D games. Because moving around in a 3D space with a D-pad is like really clunky and weird. You don't have a lot of precision. You, you can only really move in eight directions and you don't have that, that precise fluid motion. And if you take into account it, it, uh, using a D-pad and also the D-pad on the Wiimote, which um, I don't know if you've looked at that recently, but like that D-pad is tiny. And so moving around and fighting in this game was just painful. And most of the time you're holding the, the Wiimote sideways, uh, you know, horizontally. And the other thing there is that there's only really two face buttons to use. So with like that kind of fun and frantic hack and slash that Team Ninja was known for. Well, now, like, the, your only two verbs are jump and shoot, pretty much. It made the combat in Other M just extremely repetitive. Like, you would run around, charge up a shot, release shot, rinse and repeat. I realize that I may have spoiled this game for some of you out there, in which case, uh, you're welcome. I personally have no desire to play Other M ever again, but the only way you can make me play it, I I'm putting this out there. If this channel gets 100,000 subscribers, I'll play it again, and I'll record it. You can all laugh at me in my misery playing it over again. But anyhow, those two observations were the ones that I really wanted to make here on YouTube for the longest time. Um, so thank you for indulging me with this question and letting me vent my spleen a bit. Moving on. Question number two, are you on social media anywhere? Kind of depends on what you define as social media. I'm certainly here on YouTube, and I think this certainly qualifies as a social media site. But uh, no, I'm not on Twitter, I'm not on Blue Sky, I'm not on Instagram, I'm not on TikTok. If you see anybody on there that looks like me or is pretending to be me, that's not me. Um, if I change my mind on that, I'll let you know. But. I had a New Year's resolution to get off Twitter and similar sites. Um, this was back in 2023. Let me tell you, that was one of the best decisions I've ever made. I don't have any kind of moral judgment about social media or Twitter or whatever. Um, if you get something out of it, then it's not a problem. But that was the problem for me. Twitter was really falling apart from my point of view in 2022 and uh, hearing some of the brouhaha that does escape its boundaries these days, yeah, I I'm good. Uh, in general, I think Twitter brings out the worst in a lot of people. There's something I like to call Twitter brain, which, you know, the example that comes to mind is the classic parody tweet about pancakes and waffles. Twitter has this bad habit of just reducing or extrapolating takes to these comical extremes. And that makes sense because that's what gets the most engagement, right? And if you spend too much time there, and I certainly did more than my fair share in the past, it begins to encourage these sorts of behaviors. And that was really what I found out about myself, that I was just kind of performing on there. And it wasn't a good look, and I didn't feel good about it either, so I just quit. I'm also just not particularly witty. I certainly do better on long form content where I can articulate my thoughts a bit more, like here. I'm not good at the short and quippy stuff. Um, I suppose I could work on that, but 
I don't think Twitter is the place to work on that either. So honestly, I decided to unplug and there's, there are some things I miss about Twitter. There were some perspectives that I came across there that I, I probably wouldn't come across in my normal sort of circles. I do miss that a bit, but I figure I've got a good enough like start from, from what I, from, from what folks shared there. I have a good knowledge base. Um, so now it's like I go out, like if, if, if I want to go and learn more, I, I will go read books on it now instead of staying on Twitter. So yeah, I guess you could say I'm off of social media. Question number three, thoughts on a Final Fantasy VI remake? Um, I don't know. I really liked the FF7 remake part one. I thought that was really good. Cloud, is that you? Oh my God, that makeup. And that dress! Nailed it, I know, thank you, moving on. I'm still working through Rebirth, and uh, yeah, like the alternate timeline stuff with Zack is really weird, and I don't know what to make of that yet, but I need to experience all of it, and kind of, I'm kind of trying to come to my own conclusion on that. I do have to say that I hate the Hobbitification of uh, Final Fantasy VII. You know, I'm referencing the, the, the Hobbit movies where they made three movies out of a very short book. And in this case, Final Fantasy VII was one video game back in 1997. And now we're going to make this into what? Four games? Five games? And we might be done by the end of the decade, maybe. We'll see. But as far as the Final Fantasy VI remake, when I think about it, like, the pixel remaster, I think, is, is good for what it does. It's adequate. There's some really cool stuff... Um, there's a lot of scenes in six that I would love to see given that, you know, full cinematic treatment that like, uh, you know, Final Fantasy VII is getting right now. There's definitely parts, um, that could be filled in and kind of fleshed out a bit more in six. And then there's also just some really cool, like action set pieces, um, especially like in the world of balance you have like the phantom train, the Magitech factory, like there could be some, some really cool, like upgrades kind of going into a more big budget, you know, triple a, uh, remake. Uh, but I think the biggest addition that a Final Fantasy VI remake would bring, thinking on it, is, and what I would love to see the most, is, is just a whole new generation of folks being introduced to, like, the narrative and the characters. I would really love to see that. But I'd much rather uh, that they get back to, like, trying to make the main series games good again. Make, you know, Final Fantasy seventeen awesome. But uh, given the profit motive and yeah, the fact that uh, Square Enix is a capitalist enterprise, I'm not holding my breath. I'm, I'm not optimistic that they're going to pursue what's best for the games or the stories, truth be told. Question number four, what sort of equipment and software do you use to make videos? Uh, so let's see, for recording my voice, I have an Electrovoice microphone, which I don't remember the exact model of, which I run through a dinky little Babby's first mixer over here. As for recording gameplay, I have an Elgato 4, 4K60 Pro Capture card. I think I've got that, that model number right. And uh, for older consoles, um, what I do is I run them through an OSSC. Uh, that's an open source scan converter. What this little guy does is it takes uh, the analog signal. Uh, I have RGB SCART coming from uh, a modded uh, SNES, or I take a component from my PS2, and then the OSSC uh, upscales and converts that to a digital HDMI output. Um, that my capture card takes. As for software, uh, I still use all reliable uh, OBS for recording practically everything. I was using the Adobe Suite for the longest time, but uh, I hate paying rent. All landlords should be abolished, especially digital landlords. So I've uh, since switched over to either open source stuff like Audacity, which is what I'm recording in here, or uh, one time, 
licenses uh, for, for programs like uh, Affinity Photo, which is a good um, replacement for Photoshop. Um, and I've now switched over to DaVinci Resolve and I've actually uh, bought the, the Pro license for that. It's been a bit of a, a little bit of a learning curve uh, switching programs like that, but um, I'm really glad that I did it. Um, honestly, the only thing that I really miss um, is Adobe Audition. Um, and that's just for some quality of life audio, audio editing stuff like uh, their, their interface is just really nice and I don't know I guess uh, I just kind of adapted to it but uh, I'm making do without it just fine question number five how'd you get into watching troll level playthroughs so I was in the speedrunning scene for a while uh, I thought it was really awesome to see people playing um, at, a, at a high level these older games that I know and love and they were doing it for charity causes raising a ton of money in the process and overall the community was really inclusive and inviting um eventually i was doing some speed runs of Mega Man 9 myself and i've attended several gdqs which were always a great time i still have a lot of friends in the speed running community and i should really catch up with them sometime soon in the meantime uh and on this note i want to shout out my buddy and fellow youtuber dr swoman uh he does some great uh, historical rundowns of RPG speedrun progression and like the history of, of world records and like major glitches uh, in their discoveries and everything in there. It's really great, really fascinating stuff. But it was watching GDQs that I came across Carl Sagan and Trihex, uh, you know, the, the infamous Yoshi's Island runs back in the day. Uh, that's when I started following Carl on YouTube. Um, and it was here on YouTube that I saw the first couple of back and forths between him and uh, Grand Pooh Bear, uh, where they were trying to troll one another with uh, levels. And uh, I was instantly hooked. I thought that was one of the most hilarious things ever. Um, and eventually through Carl's videos, I came across, you know, others like uh, Freaking Geek, Tanuki Dan, Defender, King Bling, so on. And yeah, the rest is history. Question number six, what kind of implications would you put into mechanics of magical powers being shared between characters? An example being Chrono Trigger's dual and triple text. So for a bit of context here, this question arose from my narrative analysis of Final Fantasy VI, which you can see here, uh, editor me, do the thing. Um, I talk about the, the game's depiction of magic, and I don't want to get too lost in the weeds on it here. If you're curious, go watch that video and come back here. To answer the question, I think it depends on what magic means in the fictional setting. In Final Fantasy VI, I mention how magic is depicted pretty strongly as this destructive force, as a means to conquer other people. And so sharing magic between characters in that context reminds me of a couple of things. Uh, the first one is like deputization, right? Like temporarily granting the power of dominion uh, to someone that can carry out your will. You know, you're making a deputy of them. Uh, the second is how ruling class people have a very keen understanding of class solidarity, of class consciousness. Um, and even though they compete with, with one another frequently, but uh, whenever the, the power structure that they rely on is threatened, those, those people in the ruling class band together and work together pretty quickly. This has been shown throughout history. So yeah, that's in context of Final Fantasy VI, however. Uh, it's been a minute since I've played Chrono Trigger, um, uh, but I, I recall there being also a class narrative thing um, about magic in that game uh, around the Kingdom of Zeal. Um, you had the, the people who were up in the, the, the floating part of Zeal, and then you had like, uh, what were they called? The Earthbound ones. Um, the people who couldn't use magic, who were definitely depicted as like, uh, a an underclass in, in more ways than one. They were like a literal underclass. But in most other contexts, um, I don't think magic has this kind of like coding or uh, these sort of metaphorical implications. Um, like in Final Fantasy IX, you know, there, there might be something about the Black Mages being these sorts of uh, manufactured weapons of war, but I don't think magic has that same sort of um symbolic baggage when we're talking about like uh in that game you know vivian steiner can use like combo magic it's you know sword magic or whatever it's called so i don't think there's really a lot of 
sort of thematic baggage there. I think in more neutral contexts, uh, magic is usually just kind of depicted as this sort of like specialized skill. And so in those in those situations, you know, the team up, the dual techs, uh, whatever you want to call them, uh, I think they take on a much more positive connotation. Uh, usually when when there is this sort of combo magic option in a game, the way it's set up is that each character kind of has a has a certain like domain. They have a certain distinct like skill set, right, that the other characters don't have. Um, and so the combination magic in this case uh, it is really interesting because there, there's a lot of potential here. And like now in in, in that instance, uh, you could read, if we're doing the mechanics as a metaphor there, that's kind of saying that certain problems need a sort of confluence, uh, a, a con like a, a yeah, a combination of, of different skill sets to solve. And one person is not likely to have all of those skill sets by themselves. So it's like, that's kind of saying like we, we need we do need expertise. We do need specialists. But at the same time, that problems, we solve problems together collectively. And I think the dual techs and Chrono Trigger um, really do kind of play into that the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts kind of reading. Just off the top of my head, um, in the early game, you get, um, I think, an ability called Aura. It's a single target heal. And then you have the dual tech aura whirl and that's that becomes a group heal so the combination magic the combination skills they're not just additive they're, they're they take on this sort of multiplicative effect right it's not just doubling healing it's it's healing it's actually in this case kind of tripling the healing for the party and the mechanic as metaphor there i think maps really neatly onto like you know solidarity cooperation community and, and just like this idea of that coming together is much more than just the sum of individual efforts question number seven what's with this channel's name and all the references to hell and stuff are you a satanist or something no i'm not a satanist uh i'm not much for religion in general i guess the term atheist does apply to me but there's a lot of weenies associated with that word let's just say that i was around in the in the quote-unquote new atheist space 15 or so years ago and uh elevator gate uh there's there's a deep cut for folks uh elevator gate elevator gate was this signal that a bunch of like really hateful kids were going to make atheism their entire personality so i kind of distanced myself from them and from calling myself an atheist in that way. I personally don't have a beef with anyone who is sincerely religious. If that works for you, gives you strength and comfort, and you're not hurting anyone else by practicing your religion, then that's great. I do have a lot of bones to pick with white Christianity, uh, especially the prosperity gospel, but uh, I'm not going to get into that here and now. Now for the hellish theme, uh, well, the name Infernal Ramblings was a play on an old screen name I had, um, and I've decided to stick with it. Devils in the details, you see. But uh, I also take a lot of inspiration from William Blake's The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, um, in particular the ways in which Blake uh, talks about infernal wisdom in opposition to the sort of prevailing wisdom. Let me see if I can uh, pull up a quick uh, reference real quick here. Uh, but first, the notion that man has a body distinct from his soul is to be expunged. This I shall do by printing in the infernal method by corrosives, which in hell are salutary and medicinal, melting apparent surfaces away, displaying the infinite which was hid. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. That quote, uh, particularly the line uh, about the doors of perception, um, is where the rock band The Doors got their name, and I think they got it through somebody else. I'm trying to remember precisely there. I'm not a fan of them, but I know many other artists and musicians um, that, I'm, that I am fans of uh, have referenced Blake or have drawn inspiration from William Blake. And uh, especially and particularly um, this work, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. And I can see why. There's a lot in here that 
speaks to me. I especially like the imagery of melting apparent surfaces away and displaying the infinite which was hid. That's something of kind of my goal here, although using, using that phrase really is overstating it. I want to dig into themes and mechanics of games and maybe some other media and, and kind of give you more than just a surface reading. I, I want to share a deep love, uh, deep readings of, of these things. I also consider Blake to be an aspirational figure, personally, though I also agree with the notion that we shouldn't be putting any of our human, our fellow humans on uh, pedestals, right? Like, we're, we're all just human at the end of the day. Uh, but Blake was a writer, poet, painter, and engraver, I and mean, he was friends uh, with people like Mary Shelley, for instance. And if I recall, he was part of this group of creatives that were all um, socially and politically conscious, progressive uh, for their time. Now, is Blake perfect? No, hell no. No, per no, no, no human being is perfect, first of all. But even with Blake, I, I know off the top of my head, I can cite a line from uh, A Song of Liberty, which is at the end of The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, where he, he uses some um, racist sort of stereotypes or notions or whatever. And um, I know a lot of people try to excuse historical figures for this kind of stuff. It was like, ah, oh, it was commonplace at the time or whatever. Um, people use that for H.P. Lovecraft, but uh, he was like a, an extreme bigot even for his day. But here, I think it's worth noting that William Blake, he was an abolitionist. He opposed slavery. Um, he opposed empire. He believed in a universal humanity. And he advocated for all this stuff in his work. And, you know, while good intent does not absolve one of the harm they've done, I do think it's important to take into, into account um, when we're criticizing or assessing historical figures like these. Uh, Blake's unfortunate use of, of racist stereotypes, uh, which were not out of place, where he was. This was 19th century Britain. But, you know, that is not the same as, say, being a slaveholder or promoting virulent racism. Your mileage may vary. But for me, uh, as a creative and as a creative who, no, won't shut up about politics, I have a desire to make the world a better place. And that's a part of who I am, part of my work as a creative. And yeah, Blake is an inspiration for me. Um, and to, to quote one of his Proverbs of Hell, uh, which I've used here before, uh, if others had not been foolish, we should have been so. Question number eight, what games are you going to be playing for the upcoming video on zombies? So Left 4 Dead and Left 4 Dead 2 are at the top of the list. I love both of those games. I also have a PS1 copy of Resident Evil 2, which I haven't played in a long time. I'm really looking forward to that. Outside of that, I haven't played either Last of Us, so that's that's definitely a must. I think I also just saw The Walking Dead uh, Telltale Definitive Edition or whatever just came out, so put that on there. Aside from that, I know I have like State of Decay 2, Days Gone. I'll see if I can get some other like big budget zombie games in there. I don't know if I'll do something like DayZ. Um, is that possible to do offline? I could definitely use some uh, recommendations for smaller zombie games. So hit me up in the comments there uh, if you got any that you think I should check out. I know Seven Days to Die is on the list somewhere. And of course, I'm going to be hunting through Steam and maybe even Itch uh, for some candidates here. I've already read one book uh, for research on this video. Uh, it's called Zombies of Cultural History. I'm really excited to keep working on it. Uh, I really want to make sure this video is fantastic. Question number nine. In your game development career, where was the best place to work and where was the worst? Whew. All right, the, the back half of this question is, is super spicy. Let me address the first part, which is, is way easier to answer. My most recent corporate game dev job was with Night School Studio. I worked with them both right before and after their acquisition by Netflix. And overall, it was the best studio I've ever worked for. I love the folks there. Uh, to a person, everyone was the right combination of highly skilled, but also humble. You know, that, that sort of confidence without arrogance, uh, being hardworking, but also being great fun to be around. Working on and shipping Oxenfree 2 was a great experience. Um, there was some hecticness, there was some stress here and there, but altogether, uh, I look back fondly on it. Anyhow, I hope all the folks there are doing well. 
Now, I got to be honest here. Uh, I screen these questions because obviously I'm not going to divulge anything that's covered by a non-disclosure agreement. And that's one it type of NDA. I don't have the funds to ward off a lawsuit from corporations with dedicated legal departments. I also have signed some other NDAs. Those are non-disparagement clauses um, in severance agreements and such, which also restricts what I can say about certain employers. But thinking on this, I feel compelled to answer this question. I've been in this industry for eight years, and during that time, there's been a huge number of scandals and exposés about the working conditions in the industry, and truth be told, I don't think much has changed in the wake of these. Now, part of that is just the nature of capitalism in general, right? And, and in this case, capitalism in a field where unions are non-existent. There's no incentive for working conditions to improve. In fact, squeezing as much productivity out of workers and burning them out um, before you have to promote them, that, that's, a, that's a pretty reliable way to keep your payroll expenses down. And yeah, uh, unions are slowly gaining steam here for these very pressing concerns, but they're still quite marginal from my perspective. And part of why things don't change in this industry is that there, there's this overall chilling effect. There is this sort of conspiracy of silence that goes on whenever abuse or crappy working conditions are reported. When, when people do come forward, most of the time they do so anonymously. And they do this because there is a climate of fear that permeates this whole industry. I've uh, certainly heard rumors of people being blacklisted, of whistleblowers being smeared as troublemakers. And I've also heard from the lips of studio leaders directly, you know, credible accusations that they minimize and dismiss because the source was anonymous. Oh, well, that could be anybody making up these claims. They say, you know, um, oh, it's just a disgruntled employee or, or something along those lines. You know, they, they, they completely hand wave it away. And there's always this like severe lack of self-awareness from most studio management types because they're like, ah, oh, our studio is, is so wonderful. Th th those problems can't happen here, right? Surely. And so nothing changes. And I'm tired of it. And so I want to say something. And I may be in, 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 in a good place to do so because I don't really have any intention to work another corporate game dev gig. And yeah, I use the word gig there pretty deliberately because there's f***ing job security in this industry. Unless you're like good friends with somebody in studio management, um, yeah, you know, you'll get a Nepo hire, you'll get your golden parachute. You can, you'll get all the things that, to help you fail your way up the ladder, right? But for everyone else, there's nothing, as we've seen with the, the thousands of layoffs that have happened in recent months. So yeah, I'm speaking up here because nothing is going to change in this industry if we keep burying our heads in the sand. And I don't even, I, you know... What I'm saying here probably isn't going to change anything either, but it's something different. People just keep quiet in this industry. Things keep going on the, the way they are. I'm going to say my piece, all right? And if you're an employer and you find the following criticisms, which I think are rather mild, um, if you find what I'm saying here to be cause for concern or, you know, reason enough to reject hiring someone of my skill set, well, quite frankly, f off. All right, I don't want to work for you anyway. Now, before I get into it, I need to stress a few things. First, I can only talk about things that I've directly experienced. With that in mind, I should note that I am white and I also presented masculine during most of my time in the industry. That afforded me a much easier and much less harsh time. I have no doubt about this. My BIPOC femme presenting openly queer colleagues surely have had a much harder time and while I can't speak for their experiences, I've seen and heard, you know, I, I have firsthand accounts uh, or, or, you know, indirect accounts and also secondhand accounts of the shit that they've gone through. And 
what they go through is unequivocally worse. So this is just an example of, of just like some of the most mild things that happen in this, in this business, right? And second, and, and I really want to emphasize this here, the people that I've worked with day to day, the people who are in the trenches, as it were, they have been overwhelmingly skilled, knowledgeable, hardworking, and most importantly, kind. Yes, I've come across a few jerks in the game industry, but the foot soldiers of this business are awesome people. Like 99 out of 100, I'd say. I want to stress that the workers of this industry are the only thing, they're, they're the, the, the only thing keeping this industry from falling in on itself, which I think will be made pretty apparent here in a moment. So let's get to it. What's the worst game studio that I've worked at? The answer is pretty easy for me, as it's the one job that I quit without having something else lined up ahead of time. Let me tell you about my brief stint at 343 Industries working on Halo Infinite. The problems at 343 Industries were largely systemic, a result of being a game studio completely embedded within Microsoft's corporate structure. And most destructive to making a good game was a corporate policy that relied on staffing up primarily with contractors, which is where I came in. So it was early in 2019, and I was one of the 143 people who were laid off by ArenaNet at that time. And it just so happened that 343 was looking for people with my particular skill set. I had, so so a little bit more context here was that I I'm not from Washington State. I had moved up there to work at ArenaNet, and so now I was unemployed. Um, in a place uh, where I had a few friends, you know, I, I definitely made some friends at the studio. I had some other friends up, up in Seattle, in the Seattle area, but I had no support system to speak of at all, pretty much. Um, so I get laid off. I start interviewing with a bunch of places and just to be honest, like 343 wasn't at the top of the list. I'm, I've never really been a Halo fan. Um, and in particular, they were only offering a contract role. I was hoping for full time because that would supposedly offer a bit more job security, which it, it kind of doesn't, <laughs> as we're finding out in this industry. But, you know, as I was going around at this time, there weren't a ton of good fits out there um, for me and my skill set. And yeah, you know, just doing due diligence. Um, I interviewed with 343 and, and supposedly I killed it during that interview. And uh, yeah, I hadn't had a, a paycheck in a few weeks living in a, a really high cost of living place. So yeah, I just kind of took it out of desperation to be honest. And looking back on that, that was a huge lesson for me. Uh, not at the time, obviously. I definitely got some dodgy answers to some of my questions during the interview process with 343. You know, I was asking about the studio, about the work culture, and about that kind of stuff. And what they replied with was kind of like, eh, like, that's not a great answer, but I just kind of plowed forward and hoped for the best. And that was a mistake which I'm getting to. 343 Industries was, and I really am struggling to find a better way to put this, but it was a shit show, okay? Studio management had allegedly been like blamed by Xbox corporate for failing to get Halo 4, was it, out at the time as a, to be a launch title for the Xbox One. I'm not even sure if that's the right console. I really kind of hate Microsoft's branding. But anyhow, uh, leadership was really adamant that Halo Infinite be ready for launch on uh, what it was, the Xbox series, whatever. I, I really don't give a I remember my lead telling me that Halo 4 made it out the door by force of will, quote unquote, by force of will. Those were his exact words. And that really was a major red flag in hindsight. Because if there were any lessons about preventing crunch or really fixing their production approach, uh, you know, ironing out all the wrinkles there, those lessons, uh, they didn't take. Now, I, I could be wrong here. 
Um, but you have to figure that 343 Industries, which is a studio that is just dedicated to making Halo games for Microsoft, mind you, that they were always going to be working towards the next Halo title. I guess what I'm trying to say here is that Halo 5, following Halo 5, I would expect that the, the leadership at 343 would be taking in, like, doing a retrospective on that and really trying to solve all the pr the production problems ahead of, of working on the next Halo title, right? They certainly had a gap of a few years to, to get this done, to get their code, their development infrastructure in order to sort out the organizational and structural issues um, in the company. And yeah, just to get their proverbial ducks in a row, as it were. Now they may have attempted this, but from my limited time there, it may be more charitable to say that uh, it would be more flattering for them if they hadn't. They knew a new console generation was on the horizon, and it's reasonable to assume that Microsoft would want one of its signature franchises to have a launch title for its, you know, new and shiny console, especially after the, the Halo 4 fiasco, right? In an ideal world, they'd have gone ahead and done all of the necessary sort of pre-production work. They would have worked out the kinks in their tool set. They would have really defined clear roles for everyone on the org chart. And, you know, they'd have all of the plans and the contingencies mapped out for production. And then that way production would just be this smooth journey of making content, you know, maybe adding some features, doing, doing some debugging and optimization and just that kind of stuff. Now, I hate to say it, things never live up to ideals. And that's especially true in game development. And what I saw from 343, this pre-production work was either lacking or got derailed or something. I'm not in a place to speculate what with you know the the next console coming out you know the deadline was looming halo infinite was uh supposed to be there uh it was supposed to be out in 2020 keep in mind i i signed on in this was early 2019 and from what i saw was that leadership was panicking and they were doing what a lot of bad, you know, what a lot of bad managers do, uh, bad managers who, uh, specifically who have a lot of resources at their disposal do, which was instead of really kind of taking a moment to get things in order to really solve the, the problems, they really just kind of decided to throw bodies at the problem. They really started to staff up quite indiscriminately. They were hoping that they could just make up for any deficiencies by just having like a huge number of people working on this game. So they started to bring in wave after wave of contractors. And that's where I came in. I signed an 18th month contract. Um, again, this was early 2019. I, I should probably mention that Microsoft has been using contractors. Like this is a, pol this is a policy that, that comes from Microsoft directly. And uh, I should probably mention that, like, wh why do companies like Microsoft hire so many contractors? Um, now, there's a lot of reasons for this, but the big ones, the big ones that stick out to me anyhow, is they do it to subvert labor laws about, you know, who's on staff. And, and kind of along those lines, it's like they can do some creative bookkeeping with contractors. And... Now, to be fair, I think there's an argument to be made that using contractors in game development, there there could be a very ethical use of those, right? Because if your goal is, if all you're really concerned about is is just producing and shipping this title, a contract, and then like you're you're planning to to reduce, like you know, you're not planning to keep people around after that. Contracts make sense, right? It's much more fair. It's much more um, upfront about expectations instead of, you know, like giving people the illusion that like they've got long-term job security um, by giving them like by, by hiring a bunch of full-time uh, employees. And then once the, the game ships, just like laying off all of those full-time employees. But yeah, that ethical use of contracts, that wasn't what Microsoft was doing here. Another thing I think that needs to be mentioned is that according to Washington state law, once a, a contractor's 18 month term is up, they can't be like recontracted again by the same company for six months. Again, this is, this is some of the labor law stuff here, because it's like, if you're, if you're just constantly contracting somebody out, then like you, they're, they're really just like a full-time employee that you're not paying benefits to. 
right? So as I said, there was a huge chunk of the 343 staff that were contractors well before the, the ramp up to, to, to make Halo Infinite. And obviously this ratio of contractors to full-time employees got worse after the hiring surge. And the reason why I'm putting so much focus on this is that so many of 343 problems stem from, from this sort of abuse of, of contractual labor. There was a lot of code, there's a lot of content, tools, processes that were developed by people who were no longer at the studio. They, they, they worked on stuff during their contract and then their contract lapsed and they moved on. So there, there was a lack of continuity, and, and this lack of continuity is just extremely disruptive to game development. Hey, I need to add something uh, to this feature. Can, can, is there somebody here who can tell me uh, how that work, how it works, right? And it's like, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's so-and-so. She was, you know, uh, her contract expired three months ago, and we're hoping to hire her back in three months, but uh, it, it looks like she got a full-time job somewhere else, right? That kind of scenario, right? Really valuable contractors would sometimes get converted to full-time Microsoft employees, but that was exceptionally rare. And, and so in my short, you know, my short time at the studio, there was this constantly, you know, people were having to take on responsibilities because, you know, someone's leaving this, this other, either other contractor or, or a full-time employee now has to, to assume the responsibilities of this person that, you know, their contract's up. And that's a that's a, always a massive hit to productivity every time that happens. I want you to also think about like the strain that this puts on onto developers themselves. I empathize a lot with the full time employees there because they had to do their regular work, their regular tasks. Right. But on top of that, you know, they, they have to go make the game. But on top of that, they also had to spend a huge chunk of their time recruiting, right? Looking at uh, like the applications going, going over through candidates. So, so creating a short list of candidates from like this, this big applicant pool, doing the interviews and then like doing all of the necessary paperwork to get that, that done. And then also like, let's think about the sort of psychological impact on the on the contractors as, as well. I have to ask, would you do your best work knowing that in a few months time, it really doesn't matter like how good you've been or how much work you've gotten done, but like in a few months, you're, you're going to be out of a job. You know, when you think about that, it's it's really no surprise that a lot of the, a lot of contractors, you know, develop that, that short timer syndrome, right? I talked to a fair amount of folks and, and people were, were of course doing some job hunting when they were off the clock from 343 they they need to to make sure to, to line up steady employment for them and if they're going to be out of a job in a few months they'll start that legwork early oftentimes what would happen is people would would land a full-time job elsewhere and they would they would cut their contract short right and you could see this turnover every week you would see dozens of emails saying this is my last day at 343 Good luck, everybody. While we're on that topic, uh, yeah. Um, holy crap. Email was like the official sort of intra-office communication tool. And so you would think that when setting up new hires with their machines, that they would have a, at least, you know, some basic filters in place so that like the really important emails are, are kind of get, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff there. The important stuff wouldn't be mixed in with like, there, there's dozens of automated emails that go out and also like the going away emails, right? Where became these like reply all chains, but no, there, there weren't any like filters or anything set up. And so email was just unwieldy. And that's, that's the official communication tool in the office, right? So a lot of people just started to use other apps, Teams and uh, Skype, both of which aren't, aren't really all that great in my opinion when people you know because people were always like kind of picking and choosing all these different programs like if you needed to to get in touch with somebody it was always this guessing game about what kind of program they were using this also really brings up another thing about 343 and that's like their management had this very laissez-faire attitude towards employees like um, managing employees essentially you were expected to manage yourself and if you needed somebody else's health, like you had to go kind of like 
figure that out between the two of you. So if that person was busy with something else, it's like, oh yeah, like, uh, you know, they're, they're in meetings or, or like they, they don't see your email or whatever. You were just kind of shit out of luck. The reason why they went to this laissez-faire approach was because like supposedly they did have like a much more departmental structure in the past. A as that does, it, it kind of broke down into like a bureaucracy. There was a lot of office politics involved in the previous projects. So they do, they, they did away with it. But of course, in, in corporate brilliance, the problem is that they didn't really replace that with any kind of coordination or management. They didn't create a, a new solution. They just kind of did away with the departments and just kind of said like to the employees to fend for themselves. The email situation also reminds me of how dysfunctional the the entire like development uh, infrastructure was at 343. The build was always broken. What management did in response is they would lock the code base from, from new submissions. That would be for days at a time, sometimes weeks. I was there when it was locked for multiple weeks. So they would lock it, they would sort things out, and then they would reopen for submissions. And keep in mind, you know, a backlog of submissions is developing at this point for, for days or for weeks. When all of these new changes go in, the build broke, like would just immediately break again, almost invariably. But there were also just like issues with like their internal servers. I, I suspect this has to do with the fact that they really massively staffed up without a lot of preparation. The, the source control server was crashing frequently. And despite all of this, like you as, uh, as an employee were still expected to get your work done, um, even when it was like physically impossible to do so. Lastly, there, there were other ways that they really weren't ready for this big influx of new workers. This is perhaps the most ridiculous part of it was that they just started running out of office space. They started putting people's desks into meeting areas and sometimes in like the middle of the hallway a and keep in mind that this was like already an open office environment which if you don't know what an op open office is it's if you imagine like a cubicle farm but no cubicles so a, a company is too cheap to buy cub cubicles people had this brilliant concept of, of just throwing a bunch of desks into a huge room and that's the open office environment one anecdote along these lines that really kind of uh, it captures how ridiculous this situation was at 343 was uh, one afternoon. I'm working at my desk. I'm working on some code. I'm writing some code at my desk. I'm really trying to do head down focus time. And a team of about like eight people start having a meeting like directly behind me. The reason for this was that all the, the meeting rooms, all the meeting spaces were booked. People were just standing around directly behind me. I'm trying to get work done. And here's people having a, having a meeting right there. Like, holy crap. I have ADHD. So as you can imagine, this environment was f***ing hard mode for me. I went to my lead several times for accommodations. And I, I believe them when they said that they didn't have anything to work with. So yeah. If we take into account everything here, between this being like kind of being thrown into the deep end approach from management, having emails ignored by people I needed to collaborate with, this this incredibly noisy and distracting environment that I had to deal with every day, not being able to get work done because the infrastructure blows up. There was the fact that any like reasonable person could have predicted that there was no way the studio would would meet its deadline without overwork or crunch i i had enough at that point and there were just all kinds of unreasonable expectations there so i just quit i quit six months into my 18 month contract and to this day that was i think a, a really good decision on my part so before i finish answering this question I really want to emphasize that it's a miracle that Halo Infinite made it to the market at all, right? You can quibble about its overall quality. I don't really have a reason to argue with you, but Halo Infinite was a troubled production from the jump. COVID came around and that didn't make things any easier. So I, I just want to say, and again, you know, I really want to emphasize the people in the trenches, the people doing the day-to-day -day hard work they busted their asses to get this game done. 
like the fact that this game came out at all is a testament to how skilled they are, how hardworking they are, and how like determined they they were. The problems that I've talked about here, it's not it's not those those trench workers. It's not their fault. It's not their responsibility. I'm gonna just gonna say it. The fault for this stuff falls on corporate and studio management. My impression of them was that they were just absolutely oblivious to the day-to-day -day sort of goings on at 343. And they, for one, created the, the systemic conditions that made that production so troubled. And then also they failed to fix them as well. But you know, when layoffs come around, it's not it's not those those types of people, not the the studio leadership, not the corporate leadership that get swept up in the layoffs. You know, they get to to continue to fail upward. They get to hire their cronies. They keep making disastrous decisions, right? And this is why the quality of big budget video games is is starting to tail off, in my opinion. The capitalist class, you know, they're a cancerous growth on all of humanity and there's really no better example that i can think of than the upper echelons of the games industry thank you all for your questions if you'd like to ask a question for the next q a session next month you can do so by joining the three dollar tier of my patreon i should also mention that all patrons regardless of dollar amount get access to these future q a sessions and will get an uncensored version of this video as well if you're not interested in or don't have the funds to support me on Patreon, you can like the video and subscribe to support me absolutely free. Thanks for watching and catch you next time.